Hey, good evening, everybody. Hope you're having a good day. Thanks for dropping by. Uh, this is a crash course on the Linux shell, the terminal. And so if you're just getting started in your aspiring cybersecurity career, and you're asking, well, what are the foundational skills, the tools that I need to get myself started and to really start uh, building a marketable uh, skill set to take out there and, and sell yourself with, well, I reckon Linux is a fine place to start. And we'll talk about why this evening together. So let's get started then. I've got some concepts to introduce. Uh, we've got about an hour's time together. So I'll go through the concepts and then we'll go ahead and demonstrate some commands in my Ubuntu Linux terminal together. Okay, uh, just some info about myself. If you've never been to uh, one of my webinars here, I am a uh, volunteer for CSNP. I work on webinars like this, as well as I uh, put together a few of those podcast episodes for CSNP. I am, and I also occasionally write blogs. So uh, just trying to help the community uh, get where they're going. And by day, I work at Code Fellows as the uh, cybersecurity instructor and curriculum developer. I have a background in IT, uh, namely infrastructure, networking, and security. I've got a master's in cybersecurity. And most recently, I've been able to clear the AWS security specialty certification. And that was quite the uphill climb for me, as cloud is not my first uh, skill of comfort zone, I guess you could say. So that was quite the climb, but well worth it. Learned a thing or two, I reckon, from that. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Appreciate it. Yeah, that took about a month of pretty hardcore study and practice tests. So um, the way I see it, you know, I come from very humble beginnings. I used to work in overnight retail, of all things, making, you know, basically minimum wage in the state of Idaho, which is not much. And so I've been able to build up this career for, you know, for my whole life and get to get to where I'm at now. So if I can pull this off, then there's no excuses is the way I see it. You all can too. So, so I wanted to introduce the concept for tonight. This is the Linux shell. And if anything is gibberish or doesn't make sense, go ahead and uh, feel free to, to pop a question into the Q&A. And I'm also keeping an eye on the chat as well this evening. I see, Joseph, you've got one queued up. We'll get some Q&A time to catch up at the end as well. So uh, here are the items I want to tackle today together in this uh, presentation. I want to address the elephant in the room is how can these skills help me uh, get a career off the ground in cybersecurity, uh, namely security operations is the direction I'm steering things towards. And we're going to answer the question of what is a shell? The heck is that all about? And we're going to talk about the born again shell, better known as Bash. And then we're going to talk some theory craft. Uh, what the heck are Linux data streams all about? And then we'll get into some practical terminal navigation commands. So if you've never opened the Linux command line, and if you've never you know, navigated your way through the folder trees, uh, you're in the right place. We'll, we'll go over some beginner commands that you can try out, uh, hopefully on a, a lab of your own. Uh, Linux is free and readily available out there. And we'll take a look at some commands that uh, that are really good to practice and learn that'll, that'll definitely be relevant to a, a junior security career. And I mentioned some tools here. Uh, I don't really have a demonstration of VS Code ready today. We'll mostly be in the vanilla terminal, but I can definitely show you some VS Code basics if you'd like today uh, as we hit the Q&A slash demo segment. Uh, I see some questions coming in. I guess I can, I can field a couple of these. Uh, Martin, you're asking what uh, Linux distribution would I recommend for beginners? Uh, that's actually coming right up. Uh, hang tight. It's on the next few 
slides here. All right, Linux skills, shell navigation, scripting, and regex skills will build you a great base of knowledge and ability that you can build off of to start your security operations career from. And the languages that I recommend you start with are the shell languages corresponding to Linux and uh, Windows. So Bash is the shell scripting language. It is the shell for Linux distributions. And PowerShell is the Microsoft equivalent. So you can make lots of automation with those two languages alone. And as you get more mature in this field, you can take a look at you know, things like Python, for example, or C. And as you get more advanced in your uh, programmer skills. Uh, Martin, to answer your question about distributions, and I've pointed out some of my favorites on the right here, I've kind of facetiously put MacOS in its oldest possible uh, graphic. I I'm not a huge Mac fan. Uh, so that's, uh, I like to make a little jab at, at the Mac audience. Sorry if Mac is your favorite, but I would have to say Ubuntu is by far my favorite uh, operating system distribution ever in terms of uh, learning cybersecurity skills. It's kind of your vanilla ice cream flavor that you can turn a, an Ubuntu distribution into anything you want. So uh, what, the reason I put Mac here as a, as a joke is actually because Mac shares the Unix ancestry that Linux distributions share as well. Uh, so they come from the AT&T Unix mainframe architecture uh, and so the Mac OS terminal is actually the same as Bash. Uh, there's some slight nuances to it, but if you've got a Mac lying around or you're a current Mac user and you open the terminal, the skills I'm about to show you actually translate pretty nicely. And I'll, for a long time, I didn't know about that. Uh, my other favorite is just Kali Linux for offensive security purposes. But if you're a beginner, I strongly recommend Ubuntu desktop and Ubuntu server for uh, learning these basics. So good question, Martin. Uh, so uh, coming up here, data analysis. Uh, this is another great application is if you're dealing with uh, large swaths of data, then these skills I'm about to show you come in handy because they can parse and search through oceans of text and get you the stuff you need. Uh, Linux skills are also great for scripting and automation and that word right there, automation, is going to be, I think, a lot of people's key to their first job is if you could come in to the interview with some solid uh, scripting capabilities and add that to your value proposition, um, you know, automating things can save a lot of people valuable time. And that's what companies are looking for. Uh, SIM querying. So if you've never heard of a SIM, uh, it stands for Security Incident and Event Management Software. And what those do is they aggregate log files from all over your enterprise and let you centrally see what's going on. But in order to do that, you need to know how to query a SIM. And in this example, I mentioned Splunk Enterprise because it supports SPL query language and also supports regular expressions from the Linux side of the house. Uh, open source tooling. So things like Metasploit Framework, uh, PowerShell Empire, most of the attack tooling out there that's available to the public, as well as just regular open source tooling for security purposes, is going to necessitate a level of comfort with terminal operations. Okay, So it's good to build your base in Linux if you're headed into security. Lots of good questions, everybody. I'll hope to uh, get into those today in the Q&A for sure. So uh, first of all, what the heck am I talking about when I say shell? Am I talking about the turtles or am I talking about something entirely different? So sadly, we're not talking about uh, the turtles today. We are talking about the uh, Unix shell. And what a shell is, is it converts user input commands into actions performed by the operating system. So 
in the olden days of the Unix mainframe, these were big towering servers that all they had was the command line interface. So before computers became as advanced as they were today, um, there actually was no interactive clickable desktop. There weren't even, uh, the mouse was not a thing yet. So the command line harkens back to a long tradition of, uh, of computer expertise. And so advanced uh, computer users like pen testers and software developers are definitely going to be in terminal-ish things. So graphical user interfaces are actually still considered shells, uh, technically speaking, because they facilitate interactions uh, with, the, uh, with the computer system. So today we're studying the Unix uh, shell, the command line called Bash, born again shell is what we're uh, looking at today. So what is Bash? Well, it's a Unix command processor that typically runs in a text window where the user types commands that cause actions to happen. Uh, you can actually install Bash on Windows if you want using the Windows subsystem for Linux, otherwise known as WSL. So if you only have access to a Windows computer, but you want to learn the Linux shell, that's a, a one option you could do. Uh, the Bash shell, uh, Bash is popular for remote systems administration and consequently cyber attacks. So if I'm connecting to a remote computer, say on AWS EC2, right? If I'm remoting into a Linux computer uh, with command line access, then I'm going to be using what's called secure shell on port 22. And unsurprisingly, a lot of systems like secure Pro copy protocol are built on top of secure shell. So you can expect to see SSH quite a lot if you're headed into an, an operations type of career path. So I do wanna talk about some theory before we jump into things today. And the, the part of theory that we want to address first is the idea of Linux data streams. So if you're from my Cyber 401 class and you're attending today, these, uh, these next few slides are going to look very familiar. What are Linux data streams? Well, these let me utilize what's called standard input as well as standard output for programmatic interactions with a computer system. So these are going back to basic concepts. And what we call standard input is STDIN, also known as file handle zero. And typically you just tie open a terminal and you type in some commands. The computer recognizes those commands and it does something based on what you typed in. And those characters that you typed are considered standard input. Well, the other idea here is standard output. So what, ha what comes out of the program that I just ran? You know, if I ask the computer to do something, what is it going to print to the screen? And that's going to be standard output. And we call these, our, theoretically data streams, right? Because these are movements of data to the computer and movements from the computer back to me in the terminal. So if I wanted to take the output of my command and send it somewhere else, maybe save it to a text file instead of displaying it on my terminal, I can do something called redirection of the data stream. And I'll show you how that works later today. The other data stream is standard error. And by default, if you're trying to execute something like a bash script or a Python script, and you mess something up, you type something in wrong, you're gonna receive an error sometimes, not always. And the error is using the STD error uh, data stream, and it typically returns back to the display. So if you've ever heard of programmers talk about error handling, well, they're adding code to a script that better processes uh, standard errors that result from the script's execution, or I guess lack thereof, you could say. So that's the theory craft. Let's look at a visual depiction of data streams. So in this example, 
on the left here, we've got standard input. So I'm typing something into the Linux terminal. And what I'm telling it to do is echo foo. Okay. And that's the command that I typed in. And it's going to see what I typed, interpret what I typed, and then return foo back to the terminal as standard output. Because the word echo tells the computer to print to the screen whatever I just typed after the word echo. So this is the basis behind the whole infamous hello world command that is taught to day one computer science students around the planet. Now, if I type something wrong, so say I typed echo and then forgot the space. And if I just typed echo foo, then the data stream would become standard error. And Linux would then process, well, how am I supposed to handle a standard error? And alternatively, I can redirect the output data stream of my echo foo command to a temp file instead. So you see here, I've got a file called temp.txt and I'm typing echo foo uh, caret, I don't know what you call that, a waka or a pacman. And it's sending the output instead of to the screen, it's going to save the foo output to a file called temp.txt instead. So what I found in you know, teaching this subject matter is people who understand Linux data streams and are able to see them happen as they interact with the terminal will inherently understand Linux a lot better than if you didn't understand data streams. And so that's why I wanted to mention these here up front here as we get started. Let's go into shell commands. So what are some basic commands to get started in Linux? And I think this is a good list. This is something I put together um, earlier today. And here are some basic commands you should, uh, you should start with. So if I'm shelling into a computer and maybe I'm some kind of attacker and I'm wanting to look around the Linux environment, these are some commands that I might try. So I might say, who am I? Hit enter, and then Linux would return the name of the current profile. Or I might type hostname, and Linux is going to tell me the name of the computer system that I'm currently shelled into. Uh, another common one is looking up the IP address of this computer using IP space A. And the rest of these commands, I can definitely demonstrate later today in uh, listing the folder contents, changing the location of your uh, current shell navigator and creating and deleting files in uh, using terminal alone and no graphical user interface. Uh, I see a comment from Joe. Yes, there's actually a few ways to retrieve the IP address, right? So IPA is not the only way and chances are for a lot of these examples, they're not the only way to do something. So these examples I've pulled from Ubuntu Linux and different Linux distributions oftentimes have their own flavor of shell commands. You, you might think of it as a regional dialect, so to speak. So keep that in mind. You might see some nuanced variance between the, the ways to go about it. And I agree with Trevor there. IPA is the proper uh, modern way to look up the IP address, but a lot of distributions still support um, older means of fetching that information. Okay, so another term that you're going to see a lot in learning Linux as a beginner is regular expressions. And this is especially relevant to security professionals. And, uh, oh, I see Roger's raised, you've raised your hand. If you have a question, go ahead and uh, punch it into the Q&A. Uh, for now, uh, if you if you don't mind, and I can definitely catch up with you. So uh, with regular expressions, these relate especially to security operators because a lot of times we have these gigantic log files and we have to go into these big data sets and look up specific information that's relevant to our investigation. So in order to do that, we have to be able to uh, filter a text file down to the relevant information. So maybe we know the timestamp and we don't need to see 
all 24 hours worth of logs in that file. So for filtering text by patterns, uh, these tools called Linux regular expressions, otherwise known as regex colloquially, can help us pattern match in Linux. And so we can use this to search for a specific text in a file. And there's actually a couple of links I'm gonna go ahead and post into the chat here that I want you to check out. So if you're new to regex, and I still consider myself not a regex expert, I definitely could use practice myself. And I encourage you to look at the GitHub that I posted there and the author has written a lot of free information about regex basics, uh, including some examples. And then once you feel confident enough to take a stab at regex yourself, uh, pay a visit to learnregex.com. And it's got this cool like black and green matrix terminal that kind of guides you through some basic exercises. And I think that's a great little activity if you're brand new to this concept. And Trevor says, you know, learn regex because you'll be glad you did. I agree, definitely. You know, regardless if you become, like maybe you become a security engineer or a SOC analyst, or maybe you just decide, hey, I'm gonna be a, a developer instead. Regex is always going to be helpful to understand and to apply to your uh, Linux environments. And you'll be surprised. Regex appears in lots of tooling now. So things like Splunk Enterprise that security professionals use are supportive of regular expressions. So a lot of techniques you'll see today translate into modern security tooling, okay? And yes, Alexander, that's exactly what I was getting at, is if you're analyzing sim logs, then regex is going to be a very valuable skill. Okay, so I posted those links. Um, looks like I've got, oops, let me go forward here. Okay, so some commands for cybersecurity. And wow, time is flying, that is crazy. All right, so piping. Piping is something that I really didn't understand for a long time uh, because I'd never needed to use it. So, you know, I come from a vanilla IT support, you know, help desk heavy, uh, you know, infrastructure heavy background in my career. And for a long time, I didn't really get a chance to go deep on Linux skills. And so uh, a pipe I learned is represented by that vertical bar character that's above your enter key on your keyboard. And when I go ahead and decide to pipe something, I'm actually saying, hey, I want to redirect the standard output as the input for the subsequent command. And that probably sounds like a lot of theory craft right now, but I'll try to give you an example today. It's all about understanding data stream redirection. So yeah, I agree, Trevor. We'll definitely have to demonstrate that. Uh, grep here is the next one. And that lets us search for text occurrences of a string and returns an entire line when found. So if I've got three lines of text and the second line contains the word uh, foo, and I grep for foo, that's going to return the, the entire second line as standard output to my screen. And some other uh, tools that you should consider learning if you're headed into security are awk, which searches a file for text containing a pattern, as well as sed, which allows you to do all of those sub bullet items. So being able to comfortably open large text files in a Linux context and you know surf your way around, or that kind of skill is going to help you throughout any kind of operations career, uh, whether you become DevOps or even if you become regular sysadmin, uh, a cloud architect, all of these careers have these fundamental skills that everyone should practice and nurture, I think. And, and Linux basics are one of them. Yeah, I agree, Trevor, that these tools have been around forever. Uh, Unix has been around a long time. There's a rich history around Linux computing that I encourage you all to, to pay a visit to. So check out a lot of those Wikipedia articles about Linux, they're actually quite good. Okay, so time for the uh, demo segment. 
And, you know, a lot of those commands don't make a whole lot of sense until you get hands on and get to practice some of them. Okay, so uh, what I have here is my uh, Bionic Beaver Ubuntu Linux 1804 uh, virtual machine. And if you're wondering why I'm using an older Linux distribution, well, that's because my class today was using a tool called Rita that has limited compatibility with newer Linux versions of Ubuntu. So uh, taking a nice little detour uh, a few generations back in Ubuntu, but these commands work it all the same in the newest Ubuntu Linux, which is Groovy Gorilla 20.10. So uh, if you're a beginner and you've got VirtualBox fired up at home, or if, you're got, if you've got something like an AWS cloud account with EC2, I strongly encourage you to fire up uh, something like Ubuntu Linux, uh, maybe 20.04, 20.10, uh, something with a desktop that can ground you into something visual as you get used to piloting a terminal only environment, because that's an acquired skill. It's an acquired taste, something that you're wanting to kind of transition yourself into. So the first command I wanna show you here is, uh, is the who am I command. And that's gonna tell you the username. And you notice that the username is also depicted here on your terminal prompt as well, okay? Another command here is a host name. And host name is going to print out the name of the computer that you're currently logged into. So right, here, right now I'm currently on the Ubuntu Linux desktop. I'm viewing it through VirtualBox, but you might also SSH into this computer maybe from your home computer, for example, if you've got this hosted on AWS cloud, that would be how you interact with it. And these commands are the same either way. Okay, so I know who I am and I know what computer I'm on. And so next I wanna start moving around the terminal. So I can go LS to take a peek at where I'm located in this a computer system. And if I want to get a deeper view of like the details of each file, I can try ls-al to get a deeper view of where I'm at. Now, if you're still learning Linux and you need to read the instruction manual for a given command, uh, there's a few ways you can try to do that. Um, what I usually do is man for manual and then I type the name of the command after it, hit enter, and I can see a full-on user manual for the command in question. So if I'm new to Linux and I wanna learn about LS, I can type man LS to learn about what are the acceptable uh, parameters for this command. So LS supports dash A, as well as if I scroll down with the down arrow key, I'm trying to go for the L here. It has use a long listing format. So I'm gonna try a combination of A and L as options for LS to see if I can get myself a better outcome. So I'm gonna hit Q and go LS-AL, enter. And I'm gonna see that, you know, compared to the original method, I get a more verbose depiction of the files that are listed here. And something you'll want to know as security types is the chmod command. So the way this works, if we look at a given file, you notice that there's RWs and dashes here. Well, this stands for user permissions in terms of who can access this file and who can change this file. So if I want to open up a file such as my JSON file to be accessible to anybody in the entire planet, I'm gonna do something like chmod 777, and then the name of the file. And you know some commands just don't have very much feedback. So you type the command in, you don't get much, very much text back, but you're still able to see, uh, verify that it did something. 
And so if I type ls dash al again, and I type the name of the file, I can actually filter my view down to just that file. And I can see that I've changed the user access rights. So this first three is read, write, execute for the current, for the current user. The next one is for the group, read, write, execute. And then the final chunk here is for everybody. So everybody can come in, view this file, change it, and commit changes to memory on this computer system. So Linux file permissions are important to understand. And I had an interesting conversation in class. The way Linux handles file permissions varies greatly from how Windows handles permissioning. So you might want to approach those two scenarios differently, depending on which operating system you're in. But uh, so this is how you would change file permissions at the individual level. And if I wanted to create a file, I might go touch uh, new file.txt and do another LSAL. And you can see that I've created a new file, but there's nothing in it. So if I want to go inside the file, yes, Alexander, I agree. Windows permissioning is, oof, it's no joke with all that inheritance, a lot of policy inheritance there. Uh, so on this computer, you know, I can go into the file with a text editor of my choice, and I prefer to use Vim, but you might prefer to use something simpler like Nano. And the purpose there is to open a file inside the command prompt and still be able to make changes to a text file. Okay, so I'm going to type something like my text and go WQ for write and quit. And now I can do something like cat new file.txt to reveal the contents of this file. And that's going to say the contents of the file. So you can almost imagine a world where if you did not have access to a desktop user interface, you could conceivably access a computer system entirely through its shell uh, command line terminal. And that's how computers used to be in the Unix age before we came out with things like the Windows desktop, the Mac OS desktop, uh, things like that, that made computers more accessible. So by learning things like the Unix shell or bash, you're actually being a part of a very rich history of the origins of computers themselves. And I've always thought computing history is very fascinating. You know, things like the Turing machine, uh, the Enigma cipher, had played a big part of the outcome of World War II, in fact, if you study the history of, the, uh, of things like the Enigma cipher. So computers have had a humongous impact on our society. And by learning Linux shell, you're actually paying a great homage to uh, you know, our forerunners that made great innovations in computing. Uh, Chris says, learn the basics of VI and VIM. I agree. And that's a pretty steep learning curve, right? But it's, it's worth it, you know, if you're getting into this stuff. Okay, so it uh, looks like Trevor, thanks for posting the explanation of Chamad there. Appreciate it. Good explanation. And if you have a Kali box, like if you have a different Linux distribution fired up, the same commands should mostly work for the most part. So all of these commands should work. And if you want to access the terminal, you actually have to go Sometimes you got to go chase it down, right? So if I go to my activities button, this is like the start menu, and I type in term, right? You know, sometimes you got to chase it down and you can make a shortcut later like that. So my screen is full and I want to get rid of all this text from my screen. I can type clear and go ahead and clear off the screen there and that'll get me back in shape. So I promised you uh, to demonstrate, you know, grep uh, some of these these other ideas here, and let's go ahead and do that. So, looking at my desktop, you know, I've got this messy JSON file. Uh, you know, instead, let's go into something like my var logs folder. So if I want to change my folder, I'm going to go cd var log, and now I'm in a different place on the computer. 
And if I go LS AL, I can see a folder full of files, right? And if I'm an attacker and I want to start, you know, tampering, like covering up my tracks and eliminating evidence that I was here, you know, I might want to tamper with something like auth.log, which shows who's last logged into this computer. So let's take a look at auth.log together next. Okay. And this is what a log file looks like. So these are a series of events with timestamps on the left and corresponding event information on the right. And so as an attacker, I might want to eliminate evidence that I was ever here by performing a technique called log clearing. Okay, so uh, if I logged in as Ubuntu, maybe I don't want the systems administrators and security defenders to know that I logged in as Ubuntu. So I might want to do things like log tampering, um, or I might be a defender and need to search for something. So if I wanna search for something like PWD equals home Ubuntu, or maybe I just wanna see events that happened at 801.50, let me copy this timestamp, okay? And let me show you an example of data stream redirection. So I quit out of that view. And you notice if I do, uh, let me clear this view again. Let's go cat off.log. And if I do cat, it's going to dump the entire contents of the file to my screen. Okay, so what if I don't want to dump the entire contents of the file to the whole screen. And instead I want to search for a specific uh, word uh, such as that timestamp, okay? Well, there's a lot of ways to do this, right? But here's one way that's been a favorite of my students in Cyber 401 is this. So let's clear the terminal. And you know, here's what we originally did was cat auth.log. And instead of printing the whole mess to my screen, what if I do a data stream redirection? Okay, so let's use the pipe symbol. Let's redirect this into a new command. So Linux is going to catch that whole body of text. And now it's gonna pass that as the input into my next command sequence here, which is going to be grep. And let's go ahead and grep for uh, this timestamp. Paste that in right there. And chances are, I'll probably make a mistake. This is a live demo, so bear with me. We might get some errors, we might not, we'll see here. But the idea here is to catch something that's about to go somewhere, then send it to a different place. And that's what piping is great at. So let's go ahead and see what this does. So instead of returning the entire data dump, I was able to return the only two lines that contain the string 080150. And grep was kind enough to change the color syntaxing of this timestamp, okay? So you can imagine if I'm performing an investigation of uh, some kind of security incident, this is something I should practice and learn how to do, right? Because this is going to help me go straight to the source of an event and then help me more quickly analyze the event. And what's funny is in Splunk, this is 100% supported. And I don't know if I'm going to get the command perfect here, but if we go to a web browser and let's go ahead and open up Splunk here for just a quick demonstration of why these skills are still relevant. And if we go to, uh, let's say, let's go ahead and search for my Sysmon logs. And I've got this uh, accepting data from a Windows 10 host, and it's got Sysmon installed, which delivers enhanced log files that are geared towards security operators. And if I hit enter, that dumps out all of these, all of these logs, okay? And so yes, I could go ahead and I could scroll down 
and visually fight this mess, but it's going to be eight pages of data. And who wants to deal with eight pages of data? Not me, right? So instead, you can do techniques like this. Let me try to pipe this thing. Okay. And what if we just look for a word like uh, svchost.exe? Well, I messed up that command, but you can do things like pipe. Um, you know, let's go ahead and try, uh, you know, right here it's asking me for a command, okay? And you can look at this and go, oh, wow, this is able to take the output of my original query, which got me eight pages of data, and now I can go, hmm, what if I take that and run another command against it, right? So uh, let's see, what can I do here? I can do replace, I can do reverse. Look at all these commands, okay? And what about search? This is kind of what I was trying to do originally. Let me try search here. And I, I see like, uh, I see the chat going crazy there. Uh, but let's go ahead and search for SVC, what is that? Host.exe. And notice that it's gonna suggest entries to me. So let's go ahead and accept a suggestion. And let's look at all of my sysmon logs from all time and look for SVC host.exe. Okay, well, you know, I still got, what, eight plus pages, <laughs> uh, 4,726 4, events were matched. So, you know, I probably have some more filtering to do to get this narrowed down a bit, but you know, you get the idea. So you can take this skill of piping, of data stream redirection and apply it to an industry leading top tier SIM system used by SOC teams around the world and have it bear relevance to your day-to-day -day work. And that's why so many career advisors say, get your fundamentals solid, right? So get your Linux shell commands, uh, get comfortable with those. Right? Like if I ask you to pipe something and you know, search for something in a gigantic ocean of data, you know, now you're able to do it not only in the Linux terminal, but in an industry leading SIM tool. Okay? And this is, this is the big idea because you don't just wanna learn skills just to learn things unless you're personally interested but you wanna learn skills that, that you can take to market, okay? And th this is the whole idea, is these Linux skills that are, you know, you might think, well, these are old programmer uh, skills that I'll never use. Well, think again, right? So that wasn't the greatest demo. I still had lots of uh, results to do. What if we try, uh, what if we try this command, you know? What if we try something like uh, maybe more niche, right? Yeah, WMI, uh, I don't know, let's just, uh, oh, we can just accept one of these suggestions, see what happens, why not? Well, we made a little bit of progress. That's still a lot of data, <laughs> but you get the idea. I need to get better at Splunk myself. It's going to take some practice, but we'll get there. Yes, uh, Trevor says, get hands-on with these tools. I agree. You've got to get into these tools, but you also need to understand why you're doing something, right? You've also got to understand what is the purpose of why I'm learning this tool. Am I learning the tool just for the tool's sake, or am I learning this skill to apply to a security operation that I'm interested in performing on a daily basis. And that's what you should be doing, definitely. Um, but shout outs to Splunk. 
Uh, this is a really cool tool, right? This is really neat because I can, if I take Splunk and I combine it with something like Sysmon, I can really see what the source of a process is. And this, of course, goes outside the scope of today's talk. But you know, if you're wondering what security teams do with these skills, this is what they do. They look at the events on a computer system and they draw conclusions based on those events. So um, that's enough from me. Let's go back to the security deck here. Uh, let's go back to my slides and let's wrap things up since I'm about at time here. But let's look at this. How do I keep on learning this stuff, right? So Code Fellows, we offer uh, an entry level, uh, beginner friendly one-on-one course. I think we've got one this Sunday actually that we're about to fire off. So if you've got time this weekend and you wanna explore a career in cybersecurity, I encourage you to check this out. Let me go ahead and post the, uh, the discounted link there for you. Oops, uh, get you the right link. I just posted it, David. Oh, perfect. Great. Yeah. Oh, that's the big one. Here's the uh, small one. Uh, if you here's the shorter one for you as well. So, oh, great. Yeah, glad to hear, Swara. If you have any issues with registration, be sure to reach out to either myself on LinkedIn or give Code Fellows a call. Uh, you know, sometimes our systems, you know, computers, you know how they are. So, um, otherwise, other resources include. Linux Academy, um, they've got Linux OS fundamentals training. I'm sure Udemy has on-demand training as well. Um, otherwise, there are certifications you can also pursue. The LPIC has a great reputation. The CompTIA Linux Plus is great. And if you're trying to get better at Splunk, uh, hopefully you get, you know, you learn it faster than I do. I'm still rusty with it, but Splunk Core Certified User is your starting point, okay? And this is a nice strategy for just getting those go to market skills ready to get yourself primed for an all new career in this field. Okay, let me get to these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tony, looks like we got some time here. Uh, how are you doing on time, good? Yeah, we have about seven minutes left. So I'm going to go through as quickly as possible through these. Apologize if we don't get through all of them. Um, but we're going to go with some of the ones that I did see appear in the chat. One of them was, um, you know, what's your preferred open source scene that can serve as a backup in a in case of a malicious actor deletes a log? So log clearing, uh, Alex, is a tactic. Uh, sorry, it's a technique that is documented in MITRE ATT&CK. Okay, so if I open up. You know, if you're ever wondering, uh, what do I do against uh, an adversary's technique? Well, you want to go to this site called MITRE ATT&CK, okay? And it looks something like this. And if you go into techniques, you can see that there are all kinds of techniques. And if you search for log clearing, something like that, uh, looks like it's querying really hard. Uh, let's try log clearing. Nope. Let's take a look at defense evasion. So I don't remember exactly where it's under, but the technique of log evasion or log clearing is under the defense evasion uh, tactic under the MITRE ATT&CK taxonomy. And these are things that I teach in my cybersecurity 401 class. Um, to get you primed for something like a SOC team. And when you look at a given technique, let's look at abuse elevation. It describes the adversary's technique and we can go to the bottom and we can look at mitigations. And these are defensive things that you can do to hopefully prevent or respond to somebody's um, attack technique, okay? So do check out MITRE ATT&CK. That's my uh, best answer for that. But other than that, the other part of your question was, what's the best open source sim? Uh, hands down, it's Elastic Stack is the best open source sim. Perfect. Thank you, David. Our next question is going to be from the Q&A section. And Joseph Lewis had a couple of questions. His first one being, which Linux commands do security engineers use often or find beneficial? 
um, not necessarily security commands like nmap, nc, et cetera. Okay, so what Linux commands do security professionals find the most beneficial? Was that the question? Yes. Oh, I see it now. Perfect. Okay, so security engineers, you know, they're building, you know, detective controls, they're making automation. And uh, I would say, you know, the ones that come to mind are, are some of those that we just showed, like piping, grep, word searching, aux, sed, those are the ones that come to mind uh, if, if you're talking about security context. And if you're talking about regex, uh, the one that I use a lot is the wildcard command, which is represented by the asterisk above the number eight on your keyboard. Because if I type something like, uh, you know, if I'm looking for the word America and I type A-M-E-R wildcard, put an asterisk at the end, that tells a regex I want to search everything that comes after A-M-E-R. So it's going to return the word America. Um, it might return the word Amerigo. So there's lots of cool logic you can do. Check out the wildcard character. Awesome. Thank you for that, David. Another question that we have is, um, what version of Bash are you running? What version of Bash am I running? I'm running the one that came with Ubuntu 18.04. So if you load any kind of Ubuntu Linux computer uh, operating system, it's going to come with Bash out of the box. And the most you need to do is maybe update the OS upon installation. Wonderful. Um, next question that we have is from Chris Luck. Is IP-A um, as the same as, excuse me, let me restart that. Is IP-A the same IP as the one from IP con IF config? Yeah, so IF config, that's the old one, okay? And that's officially deprecated now. So you, you know, if I'm, you know, I'm an instructor, so I need to be teaching the currently supported tools and commands. So if I'm teaching a student, I, I'm going to teach them IPA because that's the supported command. But in some distributions, ifconfig still works. And in some Linux distributions, it does not. So there's, you know, every distribution has its little local regional dialects, so to speak. Yep. Awesome. Another question that we have is, can you only pipe once or can you invite pipe more to narrow, refine the search more, for example? I like it, challenging my skills over here. Let's, let's give that a try, actually. That's a great idea. And you know, the simpler way would be to go back to this example here and I can press up. Let's go ahead and pipe it again and see if we can look for Pam Unix this time, right? Let's look for that. Let's be sure to make this a string by putting it in double quotes. And let's go ahead and hit enter. Oops, I forgot something. I forgot to say rep, okay? So that rep right there is a standard error. Notice how that came back to my screen. And let's go ahead and hit enter. And now see, I grepped two times. So it's kind of like uh, those Russian dolls where you like open the big doll, there's like a like 10 more inside it. You can grep as many times as you want, so. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Great analogy with the Russian dolls. Um, one, one last question that we have from the audience is, can you recommend any resources for Android forensics? Resources for Android forensics. That is not my specialty. <laughs> I have to pass on that. <laughs> I one, know that's but... a, that's a lot uh, that's out from the left field, but I figure I throw wow. that one out there. Honestly, you know, if I was going to go into mobile, I would just want to first learn how to develop for a mobile operating system first. So I think that would be my instinct as to how how does a developer build an app for the Android ecosystem, and what do their tools you know, what strengths and weaknesses there um, of the way they're developing software. And I, I, I don't know, that's where I'd start, but that's just me. Gotcha. All right. Um, how are we doing on time, David? I know it's at the top of the hour and I wanna be cognizant of your time. Would you be open to answering a couple more questions? 
Oh uh, yeah, sure. I can I can take more questions uh, if okay. you can hang out, Tony. I can. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and um throw you two more, and then we might have to call it a night. But I do appreciate everyone joining us this evening. So the next question is, um, what do you think a good study guide would be for Linux Plus? A uh, good study guide is if you can access the official study guide for a certification exam, that's always my top recommendation. And I know it's not always cheap, but you know, if you're a part of things like the CompTIA Academic Partner Program, you can get a discount on their study materials. And I am a part of that through CSNP. But there's, uh, you know, look for creative ways to get the official study materials. And if you can't get your hands on official study guides, um, try to find one that's current to the exam that you're about to take. So check the exam versions. And the, the AIO series, that's the brown book uh, with the red text, that series is pretty, pretty good for readability, right? So if you want something that's approachable, that's not dry, the, the Mike Myers books are, are pretty solid in the all-in-one series. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. The next question that I have is, from Jason Castillo, would you recommend a Linux, Linux certification early on in cybersecurity training? And if so, which one would you pursue first? And I think you might've touched upon that, but I wanted to uh, throw that out to you again. Uh, you know, any of those, I mean, if you want to really be as trendy as possible, my gut instinct is actually go with Splunk Core. If you really want to have like a modern, modern, um, you know, keep super up to date with the tooling. If you feel comfortable, you could start there. But I think the Linux fundamentals are really for yourself. Like it's for your own success as a professional in this space. And that's how I always approach it. But any of those three that I mentioned are, are solid, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Well, I think that is it for this evening. And um except we have one more question, actually. I can take them. Yeah. Um, as a security analyst, is a solid one month of studying good for CompTIA Security Plus exam preparation? You know, questions? Uh, I'm sorry. Questions, <laughs> like, questions like that are so hard to answer because it's like my favorite answer is it depends. Like, I don't know how good of a test taker you are I don't know if you're an effective test crammer. I don't know your level of experience in the field. Those are all questions you have to ask yourself. But what I would advise you do, if you wanna ping that idea off people, is join a good study group. So get yourself on Discord, get plugged in with other people that are studying for that exam and you know, pose your question there. You know, Say, hey, I've got this level of experience. I've got, I'm wanting to clear this in this amount of time. And you might get some good feedback there, right? But you know, for certifications, everybody's different. Everybody has different experiences and you really have to get to know yourself. And here's a trick. Here's a trick that I do. And this is how I clear at AWS is I will take a reliable test bank. So for AWS, I took the Cybex practice test bank uh, for the security specialty exam. And I kept taking... 20 question practice quizzes until I could reliably score to about 80% every quiz. And that's my personal standard. That's how I know that I have a good shot at passing the real exam. Okay. And so I don't really, um, you know, I don't really feel good about taking a test until I can clear that personal standard. And so as you get to take these exams, you'll develop, well, what's my personal standard? And if you don't have one, you know, feel free to borrow mine, which is 80% on a reliable practice test bank, uh, practice test quiz or uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, David. That was awesome advice. <laughs> um, so it looks like we're out of time, folks, but I did want to go ahead and drop in our um, link to our Slack channel. Um, that's 
you know, we do have a bunch of folks on there that do ask questions and I have found like really great resources on there for all things related to cybersecurity. So definitely check it out um, if you want, you're interested in continuing the conversation. Otherwise, definitely feel free to stalk David Lee on LinkedIn. Maybe not stalk, use the word stalk, but definitely feel free to reach out to him and ask him with any questions that you might have, you know, relating to this particular presentation or anything else, you know, cybersecurity uh, related. So yeah, please um, do. And it, if you do, please like give me a note saying like where you're from, because I get spammed a lot. So be sure to include <laughs> that. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, definitely reach out to him. He's a, he's a great guy and um, very approachable. So Everyone give a big round of applause for um, David Lee. And, um, you know, we will be uploading this recording shortly and hopefully we, we can get a copy of this presentation and we will be sending it out um, sometime this week or early next week. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Hey, good to see you everybody. Have a good night now. Bye. Bye.